Okay. Thank you, Bill, and welcome everyone. Our title is Presidential Grab Bag, The Variety You Can Collect. It's about collecting U.S. presidents on philatelic items. Most of the items I will show are from my own collection and are relatively common and inexpensive. Though everybody, though, although obtaining a few of them took some luck and cost more. Okay. What you will learn from this presentation, the history of president's first appearance on stamps, topical or thematic items related to presidents, presidents most often depicted on US stamps and which are the most popular on worldwide stamps, election items to consider for your collection. I've tried to make this presentation non-political. Notice I have on an orange shirt, not red or blue. And so let's get started with a little background information on presidents and their first appearance on stamps. You are all aware George Washington, our first president, is on Scott number two, issued in 1847. Unfortunately, this pictured stamp is not from my collection. It's one of those expensive ones. Washington was unanimously elected to two terms because there was no opposition. But by 1796, something unforeseen by the founders occurred. Men of different points of view began to form political parties. The Electoral College does not actually elect the president. The House of Representatives approves the vote, and if no candidate receives a majority of votes, must decide the election. Also in the early years, the candidate with the leading electoral votes became president, and the second place became the vice president. The campaign of 1800 was emotional and hard fought, with both sides believing a victory by the other would ruin the nation. Sound familiar? The electoral ballot contained three names, incumbent president, John Adams, Jefferson, who was running for president, and Aaron Burr, who was supposedly his vice presidential running mate. Be, but because of the outdated constitutional provision that did not distinguish between offices, all three names were on the same ballot, and so none of the three received a majority of the electoral votes. Therefore, the decision went to the House, where, there, where Alexander Hamilton shaped the unpredictable outcome whereby Jefferson was elected president. Thomas Jefferson was our second president to appear on a stand. In 1804, the 12th Amendment was ratified to allow electors to cast one vote for president and one for vice president. This seemingly would correct the problems from 1800. But in 1824, John Calhoun easily collected the majority of ballots for vice president, but there were four contenders for the presidency. John Quincy Adams, Henry Clay, William Crawford, and Andrew Jackson. None received a majority of electoral votes, so once again, a contingent election was required in the House, with the amendment also stating only the top three candidates are eligible. Jackson had the most plural plurality of electoral votes, followed by Adams, Crawford, and Clay, who was then in ineligible. Because they shared similar views, Clay lent his support to Adams, who won the presidency on the first ballot in the House. But in 1828, Jackson easily defeated Adams in the electoral vote, and he was the third president on the blackjack to be on a stamp. And Abraham Lincoln in 1866, which should probably be considered the first memorial issue because it was issued uh, with about a year after the assassination. Four more presidents appeared on their first stamp before 1900. Zachary Taylor in 75, James Garfield in 1882, and Ulysses Grant and James Madison in 1894. In the, what's called the first bureau issue because it was the first issue done by the U.S. Bureau of Engraving and Printing or the BEP. 
eight presidents had a stamp in the first just 50 years of postage stamps. But during the first 125 years of our country's existence, up to 1900, there had been 25 presidents. During the first third of the 20th century, there were six more presidents elected, but nine more presidents made their first appearances on stamps. Benjamin Harrison, James Monroe, William McKinley, Theodore Roosevelt, Rutherford B. Hayes, Grover Cleveland, Warren G. Harding, Woodrow Wilson, and William H. Taft. Monroe and McKinley in the top row are commemoratives from the Louisiana Purchase Exposition issue. The Harding stamp in the lower left is a memorial issue. In 1876, the third and to date last election determined in the House of Representatives occurred amidst great controversy. Three Southern states, Florida, Louisiana, and South Carolina, each sent two sets of electors, and one elector from Oregon was declared illegal and replaced. An informal deal referred to as the Compromise of 1877 awarded all the electors to Rutherford B. Hayes in the middle of this slide in return for the Republicans withdrawing all federal troops from the South to effectively end Reconstruction. So let's look at a little historical context here. Five, many future presidents have previously served in the military. Five future presidents served as Union officers during the Civil War. Grant, Hayes, Garfield, Harrison, and McKinley. All five were born in Ohio, although Grant and Harrison are more associated with other states. All five were Republicans. Here are the party affiliations of the first 17 presidents to appear on stamps. Washington did not believe in political parties. Taylor was a Whig. Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe were Democratic Republicans who believed in reduced national authority so that people could rule more directly through state governments. Jackson, Cleveland, and Wilson were Democrats. Abraham Lincoln was the first Republican president. When running for re-election in 1864, he formed a bipartisan electoral alliance with the War Democrats by selecting Democrat Andrew Johnson for his VP and running on the National Union Party ticket. Grant, Hayes, Garfield, Her Benjamin Harrison, McKinley, Theodore Roosevelt, Taft, and Harding were all Republicans. In 1933, when Franklin Roosevelt was inaugurated as our 32nd president, only 18 of the previous 31 presidents had ever been on a U.S. stamp. I'll regress here to state that Grover Cleveland is counted as both our 22nd and 24th president because he served two non-consecutive terms. Of even greater significance for the future, six of the nine honored uh, since 1866 were Republicans and only three Democrats had appeared on stamps. Whether Roosevelt was the first to suggest a new presidential series that included all past presidents as a political statement or not, the subject was first discussed in the philatelic press in 1934. Others were advocating for a national park series with support for it becoming the regular issue and the presidents being commemoratives. In my mind, thankfully, they did not prevail. Discussion diminished until Roosevelt was elected to a second term, and in 1937, the Treasury Department announced a design competition would be held for the new presidential regular series. The Prexies were issued in 1938. One to 22 of the denominations were matched the order of the presidents. The other seven are in order. 
but they don't match. The additional stamps in the set were the one and a half cent Benjamin Franklin, the one and a half cent Martha Washington, and the four and a half cent White House. Every president, not including those last three, but every president stamp in the set could be used alone to meet a current postage rate. And this was the regular definitive series until the Liberty Series came out in 1954. Six presidents had their first issues between 1939 and 1985. All could, should be considered memorial issues because they were issued shortly after they, their death. Franklin Roosevelt had a set of four. Notice that the White House is on the three cent also. John Kennedy in 1964, Herbert Hoover in 65, Dwight Eisenhower in 69, and Harry Truman and Lyndon Johnson both in 1973. The International Stamp Show, which is held in the U.S. every 10 years, was in Chicago in 1986, called Ameripex. Four miniature sheets depicting 35 presidents in the House and the White House were issued at this show. The last of the four miniature sheets here included the previous six presidents, Herbert Hoover, Franklin Roosevelt, Harry Truman, Dwight Eisenhower, John Kennedy, and Lyndon Johnson. Since 1986, stamps have been issued for four more presidents. Shown here are cutouts from American commemorative cancellation pages. We'll see a full page size page later. These are once again memorial issues. Richard Nixon in 1995, Ronald Reagan in 2005, Gerald Ford in 2007, and George Bush in 2019. Since the other five presidents that haven't appeared on a stamp yet cannot appear, are still living, they cannot appear on any U.S. stamps yet. Now let's look at some other topical and thematic items for your collection. There are only two airmail stamps that depict presidents. Lincoln, which is sort of unusual, I think, in the Mount Rushmore National Memorial with Washington, Jefferson, Lincoln, and Teddy Roosevelt. There are newspaper and periodical stamps. I have no examples. Washington is on three and Lincoln is on two. Here is an aerogram. What is an aerogram? It's light, thin paper. You write, wrote the message on the other side of the paper. You fold it in the left side, fold it in the right side, fold it up the bottom section, and the flap down from the top to seal the envelope. No contents were allowed in an aerogram. Notice this says Kennedy on it. On the next page, Vice President, the Herbert Hubert Humphrey is the only vice president who did not later become president to appear on a U.S. stamp. There are five first ladies that appear on stamps. Martha Washington, Dolly Madison, Eleanor Roosevelt, Abigail Adams, and Lady Bird Johnson on a souvenir sheet. How about monuments, monuments, memorials in the White House? The Washington Monument, the Jefferson Memorial, the Lincoln Memorial. And for the White House, James Hoban, the White House architect, appeared on a 20 cent stamp in 1981, also an 18 cent stamp that looked identical to it other than the, the amount. And here are three other examples of the White House on stamps. Booklets often have a variety of different panes, sometimes with labels used to fill in to fill the panes. The single stamps themselves have a numeric numbers assigned by Scott, whereas the panes normally receive an alpha suffix. Let's look at some. Here's a 24 cent booklet, number 121, and it has three of the 1395A panes in it. 
Now here's a combination booklet, booklet 122 in this next column. It has 12 eight cents stamps. So it has two of the 1395B panes and four or one of the 1278B, so it's four cents to make up the dollar amount. And over in the last column, we have an eight, eight cent booklet with 25. Well, how do we get to that? This is a kind of an oddity because Scott lists the 1395D slogan five and also the 1395D as slogan four. But there are three of these 1395Ds in the booklet and that comes to 21. So how do we get to the 25? Well, there's another pane not shown that has the four stamps here and it has two double sized filler panels saying the same kind of, giving the same kind of information, use zip code and mail early. And this is the back cover of the booklet. How about overprints, presidents on overprints? Well, there's a Kansas, Nebraska issue and here's some samples from it. And there were commemorative stamps for the Battle of Monmouth, Molly Pritcher and a Hawaii sesquicentennial. There were two stamps for that. Both of those were in 1928. And then there's possessions. Here's an example, a block from the canal zone and a single from Puerto Rico. And it's a little hard to see on this, but Puerto Rico goes up diagonally and Porto is spelled P-O-R-T-O. -O. How about official stamps? Officials are stamps used by nine executive branches of government, which were issued when the franking privilege was abolished on government business correspondence. And the nine are listed down here. The post office does not depict the president. Mm -hmm. There are 93 total stamps in the series. Washington, Jackson, Jefferson, and Lincoln are the only presidents depicted. The same person always appears on the same denomination. Here's Lincoln on the Navy Department stamp, Lincoln on the Treasury Department stamp, and Lincoln on the War Department stamp. And the Treasury Department here has all four of those presidents on it. Stamped or embossed envelopes. There are many varieties, including dyes, uh, surcharges, and paper colors. The first two here on the left, both have nine varieties of dyes and different, several different issues. These two in the upper right are both have surcharges. And you can see three different shades of paper color involved here. Postal cards. Notice the difference in size of the grant in the upper right. Notice in the lower left, in the it's back and front of the same postcard, this is very kind of interesting because it's similar to a wanted poster. The local police would print and mail postal cards to nearby areas to announce rewards and gain citizen help in, in catching the criminal. Also notice here, this is called, the middle one on the bottom is called the small wreath around the portrait of Jefferson. And the one on the right has the large wreath. Now here's some more postal cards. The top row is all McKinley. The one on the left is a memorial postcard. The one in the grant in the lower left is says Universal Postal Union here. It was used for international postcards. The two on the right, the two Jeffersons, both are surcharged. It's a little hard to see on the red one uh, because there's a cancel on there too. It says one cent and the other one is the two cent. 
Now, postal cards with reply are double postcards generally used by businesses to encourage their recipients to reply because the postage was prepaid. They consist of two attached postcards folded on one side. The in the picture, the right side is the back of the left side. And then it's folded along the fold line here. The recipient opens the card, fills out the form, detaches it before mailing it back, which is the reply. Now this one is a little bit different than most of the reply cards because it's George on the front and the reply has Martha on the back, a little hard to see upside down. But then it has this indication here that this is a re reply card. Grant, Lincoln, and McKinley all have reply cards, but generally do not have the re reply mentioned on the back, and they have the same picture on both cards. Revenues. Now, this is a real busy page, but these are virtually all different res revenue stamps on this slide. The similar ones are different because of the band on the lower part has different, this one's agreement, this one is certificate, express, and inland exchange on the last two. The re, there's three exceptions on the page. This is one of them where they're there to show color variations due to environmental or chemical reactions. Washington appears on over 150 revenue stamps. How about the Confederate States of America? Washington, Jefferson, and Jackson were all slave owners. In fact, 12 of our first 18 presidents through Grant owned at least one slave at some point in their lives. John Calhoun is on here because he was a US VP before the war between the states, as the South referred to it. Now here's some inauguration covers. Uh, notice on the two Nixon ones, the difference in the franking, the difference in the um, date stamp, and the difference in the killer bar length separation and the uh, font. American commemorative cancellations have been sold since 1972 by the USPS, generally through subscriptions. You can often buy most of them cheaply on the secondary market. They contain information about the attached stamp and first day cancellation. This example for presidential libraries issue shows 13 different first day cities up in this area. This sh slide shows all 13 first day cancellations. Franklin Roosevelt articulated the need for a safe, accessible archive for the materials of each administration. In 1939, he pledged part of his Hyde Park, New York estate for the construction of a library and museum for his own papers. Since then, the National Archives and Records Administration operates 14 such libraries housing the papers of subsequent administrations. Additionally, there are 20 plus other presidential libraries operated by different organizations. If you attend a first day ceremony, you will receive a program. This is an outer envelope from the ceremony for the Clinton Library. The, the program lists the speakers who normally will autograph it after the ceremony. But I leave, believe Clinton's here is a facsimile. The back side of the program tells a story about the stamp. Now here's the, uh, the Reagan first day ceremony, which was held at the Re Ronald Reagan Presidential Library. Here's a Johnson in Memorial. Again, this was the first Johnson stamp. 
the Kennedy is not the first Kennedy, but it's, but it's another first day cover. Here are some booklet panes on first day covers. These have caches that show the Jefferson Memorial and the Jefferson portrait also. Okay, this is an event cover from the National Topical Stamp Show in 2013 with, with a ranking by with a James Madison stamp on it. Here's a cover from a stamp club, ATA Chapter 5 in Wisconsin, when the, soon after the Kennedy stamp came up. This was in their newsletter. Now let's look at some foreign sheets. The first slide shows a set of three sheetlets depicting 43 presidents. Not shown as a souvenir sheet for the 44th president, Barack Obama, with some symbols on it. Here's some foreign souvenir sheets. Notice on the Ghana sheet, there's uh, Lincoln's home is the inaugural address, facsimile signature, and a adaptation of the 1869 U.S. stamp. Here's a Honduras with double overprints on it. It has black overprints for the Olympic rings and the year 1964, and red official overprints, notice the spelling, on it. This is an interesting stamp because it shows Lincoln's birthplace, Lincoln's cabinet, the Lincoln Memorial, the Gettysburg Address, and the assassination. Probably the only stamp that shows the assassination on it. The only one I'm aware of. Here's a Cinderella sheet it, produced by the H.E. Harris Stamp Company in 1977 when there were 39 presidents. Here's some Roosevelt Cinderella stamps. The top row, this stamp here, the second from the right, I owe my life to my hobbies, especially stamp collecting, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Seems like a normal feeling these days for a lot of people. And this one, a stamp collector for president, the stamp of approval, Franklin D. Roosevelt, member American Philatelic Society. These were poster stamps issued in 1932 and uh, promotion attributed to George Lynn, publisher of Lynn's Weekly Stamp News. So who is your favorite president? Or more importantly for this presentation, which presidents are most popular in philately? It creates a dilemma because the US and worldwide have very dis different perspectives. Before showing you the answers, I'll show you where I got the numbers. I have taken the number of US issues from the Scott Catalog Subject Index of Regular Commemorative and Air Post issues, which does not contain any other back of book items. I have taken the number of worldwide issues from the ATA website listing of entries on the various checklists, which do include some, but not all back of the book items. So here's the rankings, the top 12 rankings and the com total compilation to the right. The, word, the ones that have asterisks do not appear on the other list between US issues and worldwide. And you can see there's quite a disparity here. So what are some of the reasons this may occur? People may not appear on US stamps while alive. So Obama is pretty high on the worldwide issues, but cannot, he's down here in the six or less with zero on the, world, on the US. The status of World War II heroes, which gains significant respect from other nations. Notice Roosevelt is here, he's down here. Eisenhower is here, he's down here. And Truman is 12 on worldwide and down here in the six or less on the other. 
Another reason that there's a difference is the more recent proliferation of stamp issuing countries and issues, which some of which have dubious standing in some philatelic circles. Look at the Kennedy numbers, the Obama numbers, and the Reagan numbers as examples. On the other side of the ledger, the U.S. of president, presidents who appeared before the 1938 Prexies had greater chance to be in other series before that issue. These are all people who appeared before the Prexies, all these asterisks. For the most part, numbers may or may not include most back of book. Air Post does not help the U.S. numbers, there were only two, but would the World War II I mean the worldwide, not all back of book are included in the ATA list. Let's move on to election materials. Here's some covers asking for donations for this year's election. Notice they both use the same stamp. How about some philatelically inspired items from the 1964 election? Here are two typical campaign items, which someone had canceled in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania on November 3rd, 1964, which just happened to be election day. I picked this up from a dealer's miscellaneous box and only later discovered the um, date connection. I doubt that the dealer knew it either. Here's the 19th Amendment women vote stamp. I thought the cover in the back is interesting. It has a Hawaii cancel, and I don't imagine there'll be too many of those that get here. And this is collect stamps, the most educational hobby here. This is the pain of 20 stamps for the women's vote. It can, comes in a deck. And this is called a deck card that's on the front of the deck. The deck in this case has 25 panes in it and an admonition that it shouldn't be sold before the first day date of sale. Well, when it gets into the post office, somebody wrote this date of 822, which is the first day on this, on this uh, card. I was at the post office on the day before 821, and they told me they had received two packages which would go on sale the following morning. That meant 50 panes. Knowing this would be a popular issue, I arrived shortly after opening on Saturday. As I paid for my purchase, I asked if I could have the deck card, which was then retrieved from a wastebasket. I wish that I had thought to have a cancellation applied to it as it was the first day of sale. And on the next page, you'll see another reason why. The photograph at the right was taken with my iPhone under shortwave UV light. You will notice a stripe right down the middle of these stamps of purple which means that there was no tagging at that location on this pane. All of the pamps, panes I bought that day have that stripe on them. After seeing what I had, I dashed off an email to Captain Tim. You will have to read his response in the October American Stamp Collector and Dealer, which is probably in the mail to you right now. But there, there was missing tagging here. Um, we don't know how prevalent it is. I've been watching the philatelic press. Um, only three other people have been told about this besides myself before this presentation. So if, and I did ask my stamp club members, uh, I've been going to three fairly close post offices and only one day out of about 12 trips have I even been able to buy more panes of this stamp. So we've got no idea how many of these are out there. 
but if you have any, pull out your UV light and take a look. I'd like to hear. I will close, close now by encouraging you to vote. If you decide to vote by mail, the post office sent you a letter. If you plan to vote by mail, plan ahead. Here is my ballot that came, official vote by mail balloting material with a enclosure that said put two forever stamps and 70 cents postage on it when you mail it back. Now our ballots here in Florida are maybe a little bit unusual and bigger than what you will have because we had seven pairs of president and vice president on our ballot to vote for, not just Trump and Biden. We also had six con state constitutional amendments to vote on. So it, it was a rather large ballot. So I don't know if you need two stamps or not, but be sure you put enough postage on them. But if you decide to go in either early or afterwards, you won't be putting your ballot in a ballot box that looks like these, but you will get the sticker after you turn your ballot in. Yeah, this is really my last slide. It gives you the sources that I used to get the information. Um, here's the American Topical Association website, the list of the checklists and the top by topics, and it gives you the topics. That's how I got the information. And the Scott catalog, particularly the subject index of regular and commemorative air post stamps. Uh, some books here, the Prexies by Roland Rusted. Identification Guide to U.S. Stamps, Regular Issues by Micarelli, I believe that's pronounced. Guide to U.S. Stamps by the United States Postal Service. And you can find anything on the web that you want, any statistic you want. I believe you can find the, the height, probably the eye color, uh, whether they're left-handed or right-handed, all over the website. But the big ones are the National Archives and the Library of Congress. And here's my email. And with that, I will stop sharing.